Hello, my name is Jeremy Fortner. The following is a conversation with Dr. Brand Fortner, a research scientist and professor of astrophysics. Dr. Fortner has his PhD in high energy astrophysics from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and currently serves as professor of astrophysics at North Carolina State University and as adjunct professor of physics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Fortner has previously held positions at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, NASA, the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and co-founded software company Spyglass Incorporated. Spyglass was an integral part of the creation of the world's first interactive graphical web browser known as Mosaic in the early 1990s, predecessing the well-known dot-com boom. In my conversation with Bran, we speak about his expertise in astrophysics, his story career, and the creation of his software company, Spyglass. I was fascinated by his life and career and decided to reach out. We share several interests, such as our love for computers and our curiosity on the nature of reality. I currently serve as the president of the San Diego Miramar Computer Science Organization, through which this talk was organized. Accompanied with me are my peers, classmates, and fellow members of the San Diego Miramar Computer Science Organization. This conversation is hosted as a Zoom interview. At the end, we open up a Q&A for the viewers of this meeting. This is the Jeremy Fortner podcast, and now I present to you, Dr. Brand Fortner. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce myself first. My name is Jeremy. I'm a sophomore at Miramar. I'm studying computer engineering. We have Andrew Hang here. He is our faculty advisor. Go ahead and introduce yourself however you'd like. Sure, I don't want to take up too much of uh, Dr. Fortner's time, but yeah, I've been working as a software engineer since 1999, uh, you know, 23 years of uh, commercial experience, you know, went through Web 1.0, 2.0, I guess 3.0 <laughs> these days. Uh, worked at three successful startups. Um, first was JWE, a low voltage subcontractor. Uh, also, yeah, they did smart home systems way back in the early 2000s. And, yeah, my job there was just to switch uh, completely from you know paper paperwork to fully electronic and then I had, that was uh recently acquired by red rock it and even to this day i got a nice uh payout <laughs> like almost two decades later yeah. um, my next company was uh called language weaver um it's a statistical machine translation company uh, originally it was started just for the u.s government the department of defense um, the soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan at the time used our software to do voice to voice, you know, English to Arabic translations. Um, you know, back then computers were big, we didn't have phones, so they had these huge backpacks. <laughs> oh, wow, yeah. Translation. Um, and we were bought out by a British company called SDL. Um, and then after that, all the US government contracts were canceled, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. So now we're doing mostly. Uh, a natural language generation um, and AI. Uh, my recent projects are um, autocomplete for translators and uh, suggestors. Do like you know, question and answer FAQ gener automatic generators off of uh, you know manuals. Um, also do like sentiment analysis. You know, say like financial documents. You know, will pass it into our system and it'll tell you whether or not. You know, to buy or sell a particular stock. Um, and in between there, I also worked at a, a high-end uh, e-commerce startup called Zola. It's still around now. Um, they got into their Series D funding, uh, 100 million bucks. And yeah, after that, um, I wanted more, like, I, I also have three kids at home, so I wanted to spend more time with my kids. And I wanted to get out of the startup life. So I actually switched back to the SDL, which is recently merged with RWS, another British company. Um, but yeah, every time there's like mergers or buyouts, um, then yeah, employees get, employees that have stock, yeah, get paid pretty well. So um, yeah, you know, two decades later, I just want to give back to the industry uh, through teaching and I want to step, uh, step away from you know, the, individual contributor work, uh, you know, working with the computer and you know, teaching the next generation of students. Wow, 
Great time. And I'd also like to introduce Dr. Brand Fortner, who's coming to speak with us from North Carolina. Go ahead and feel free to introduce yourself however you'd oh, like. Oh, you want me to introduce myself? Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've had a varied career. I, uh, my uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD are all in astrophysics, um, and that's my technical background. Uh, I started uh, working in computers in the mid-70s. Um, I wrote the world's first interactive flight simulator on a system that nobody knows about called Plato. Um, and then I was a systems programmer for some years on mainframe computers, went back to graduate school, uh, and worked for the uh, Illinois Supercomputer Center, NCSA, where my team developed uh, a bunch of visualization software back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, back when um, uh, personal computers really didn't have the capability of doing visualization of technical data. Uh, I took that software and started my first company called Spy, uh, Spyglass to commercialize my uh, team's visualization software. We got venture funding. The company did okay, but not great. Um, the supercomputer center there approached us in 92 to commercialize uh, the web browser that they had developed in house. Uh, that browser is called mosaic and, you know, frankly, the rest was history. Uh, I left that company in 95, worked for NASA for some years, uh, designing the uh, data formats for the living with the star system. Uh, I'm sorry for the earth observing system started my second company trying a second time to uh, see if there's a market for low cost visualization software. Uh, I eventually wound up selling to uh, a company that was then acquired by Kodak and then went out of business. Long, difficult, painful story. Worked for the uh, US government for some years and then came down to join the faculty of physics at North Carolina State University. So done a little bit of everything. My first question is, uh, I'd like to know a little bit, Brand, about your childhood. Like, what got you into astrophysics? What got you into computers? All of that. Yeah, so I was, uh, I grew up in uh, uh, rural Ohio and rural Illinois, uh, where, you know, very poor high schools. I was always the smartest kid in the class. And, you know, I've always wanted to be an astronomer since I was like six. I, I can't remember a time where I didn't want to be an astronomer. And, you know, I didn't want to work for NASA. So for me, computing was a lot of fun, but was kind of off the side from what I wanted to do. Uh, when, uh, you know, when I came to uh, uh, the University of Illinois, for those of you that grew up in not great high schools, going to college is a real shock because you're the smartest person in your high school and you go to college and you realize everybody else there is just as smart. Um, and so I was basically just kind of an average student um, in physics. And then uh, one of the reasons I was an average student was I got sidetracked by computers and just got sucked into the computing lifestyle back. You know, this is, you know, 30, 40 years before we had personal computers and so having a, a terminal where we could interact with a thousand other people around the country, uh, both graphically and texturally, was just, uh, I mean, it was the precursor of the internet. Um, and many of the features that we developed in Plato eventually showed up um, on the internet. So for example, there is a direct line between the way we do email um, on the internet and Plato because the vice president for research at uh, uh, Microsoft was, and the developer of Lotus Notes was a uh, Plato person at Illinois. Interesting. So we have a lot of people here who are around my age. Yes. I was, I was born in 2002. So uh, I grew up roughly around the internet and all of that. Uh, how would you describe like fundamental differences in computers? And how they were, you know, thirty years ago, and how they how they are now. What are the big things that have changed? Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's uh, hard to answer because it's so radically different. I, I mean, difference of scale makes a a, a, a quantitative difference. A qualitative difference uh, makes a quantitative. I'm sorry, a quantitative difference makes a qualitative difference. 
because we were doing uh, with social networking with a thousand people. And on the internet, you're doing social networking with a billion people. And the sorts of things that we experienced were different than you experienced just because the numbers are so radically different. So for example, when the internet came out in the mid nineties, all of us, I mean, almost to the person thought that the internet was a good thing, that everybody on the planet would have access to all knowledge you know, some poor kid in the middle of a rural India would be able to get his PhD in astrophysics just by going to the internet and browsing the world's acquired knowledge. We thought it was nothing but a force for good. One of the reasons we thought that was because in our restricted environment of a thousand people, we didn't have the sort of chaos and sheer horribleness that we see on the, on the internet now. It just never occurred to us. And so a quantitative difference made a qualitative difference. Um, in terms of computing, in terms of actually programming, one thing that really struck me was that um, when in my era, if you wanted to program a computer, you got the programming manual, which was about yay thick, and you learned the language and you started programming. Um, a few years ago, I uh, was a manager at a supercomputer center at the University of North Carolina. And so I was managing a bunch of programmers. And this is after I'd been out of programming for 30 years. And what struck me was how radically different programming is today. That I remember at my first meeting, I wrote down acronyms that I didn't know. At the end of the meeting, there were 35 on my list. And programmers today don't sit there and pull out a thin programming manual. What they do is through social networking, they know about technologies that are available. And a lot of their job is knowing which technologies are good and bad and knowing how to connect those technologies. And that's what I saw my programmers doing just a few years ago was, it was knowledge of technologies and knowledge of the glue between those technologies and the interactions between those technologies, few of which they actually develop that made a great developer. So a very different feel, a very different uh, skill set. So you bring up the National Center of uh, Supercomputing. Uh, I'm curious, yes. uh, what specifically did, did they do? So um, in the uh, early uh, 1980s, uh, we had always divided hard science into what we call observational or experimental science. Of course, we can't do experiments on stars, but we can observe them. Um, and theoretical science, the people that make uh, mathematical models of reality. And you're always trying to match the observational or experimental data with the theoretical data. And so for you know, 100 years, we had viewed that there was two ways of doing science. One is observe observation and experiment, and the other is trying to figure out the mathematics of reality. Um, starting in the 1980s, people talked about a third way of doing science, which, which is computational science. Nowadays, uh, it's inconceivable that people would do science without computers. But back then, it was novel. And the, what we talked about was that computational science is a way where you actually can do an experiment with stars. You can simulate a star on the computer and you can perform experiments on it. You can, you can vary things and see what happens. And, and so it gives you a third way of trying to approach reality, a third way of trying to match the mathematics with theory and with the observations. Um, it was the glue that held everything together. And, and certainly all sciences today operate in that vein. Uh, I, I think all sciences have computation as the glue that holds everything together. Um, but this was a new idea in the 80s. Um, and there was a guy, uh, uh, Larry Smart, who was the first director of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. He was an astrophysicist by training. Uh, and he sent an unsolicited proposal to NSF in 1982 saying that the future of science is computational science. And the way you do computational science is with the most advanced computers that are available at the time. Uh, at the time, it was Cray supercomputers. And these 
um, supercomputers were um, uh, cost about $20 million back when $20 million was serious money. Uh, and they would fill an entire building. Um, in 1985, NSF uh, created the supercomputing project and funded four supercomputer centers, one at San Diego, by the way. Uh, and But the a lead institution was at Illinois under the direction of Larry Smarr, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. And we got, we started with the Cray XMP, which was the top of the line at the time, and we later upgraded to Cray II. Uh, and the mission of that center was to advance scientific computation, to advance computational science as that third way of doing science. Um, Larry Smarr was a very unique director. He's still in San Diego, by the way. Uh, he's, a, he's a renaissance man, you should look him up. Uh, and he uh, gave, gave a lot of freedom to people to try different things. Uh, in particular, he let my group try and develop software to connect to supercomputers using, at the time, primitive microcomputers, uh, such as IBM PCs and uh, Macintosh 2s uh, to connect to the supercomputer network and let science try and do some of their science on these uh, very uh, limited personal computers. We got uh, funding from Apple and we developed a series of uh, software packages, uh, including uh, packages that enabled scientists to take the data from their supercomputing runs and uh, generate images from that data. So um, I understand you also started a software company called Spyglass. Correct? Yes. Uh, what did what role did the National Center of Supercomputing Applications play in the starting of your software company and the founding of Mosaic? Yes. Uh, so when I started Spyglass, the core software that we were selling was software that my team had developed using while they were employees of the in CSA. Uh, the software was put in the public domain. And so basically we threw our own software over the fence, picked it up and commercialized it. Uh, of course, anybody else could have done that, uh, but we did it because, you know, it was our team. Uh, now, I, I, didn't, I didn't program any of that. I was just the manager. So it was myself, uh, the lead developer and an Apple executive that started Spyglass to commercialize visualization software. And so, you know, NCSA, developed the beginnings of that software and we just extended that. Um, and as I said in the intro, uh, that um, uh, selling that software was moderately successful. We did get venture funding, um, but we weren't gonna be a runaway success. Uh, and then in 1992, 1993, independent of us uh, and without actually our knowledge, some of the same people we knew at Illinois had developed Mosaic. Um, and they were being driven crazy by the, the increasing demand for support and for marketing the Mosaic. And so they wanted us, because they knew us, to be the licensor and marketer of Mosaic, in which we agreed to do. Uh, and so that was really what, spy, what people know Spyglass about. It wasn't why I started the company. Um, again, Mosaic was developed under NCSA's umbrella. Um, and NCSA was just this incredible incubator of great stuff. Um, now, it, the story gets very complicated because the NCA employees that had developed Mosaic were then uh, stolen from NCSA by Jim Clark. Uh, and started a company called Mosaic Communications, commu commercializing Mosaic. But we had already had a deal with the University of Illinois, and the software, unlike the visualization software, was not in the public domain. Uh, and so, you know, the University of Illinois sued Mosaic Communications, we sued Mosaic Communications, and the end result was Mosaic Communications was forced to change their name to Netscape, and, uh, you know, pay us a, a small royalty stream. 
So in, in terms of web browsers, nowadays people think of, of Google or Firefox. What was the evolution that brought us from Mosaic to, to Google? Right. Um, so in the early days of uh, the web browsers, um, which would have been 1994, 1995, there were, we counted at one point, there were 35 web browsers in the marketplace. 34 of them used our technology, uh, including uh, inter uh, Microsoft Internet Explorer, which was our biggest one. Uh, the 35th, of course, was Netscape, but we got a royalty stream from them anyway. I mean, they never admitted that they stole the code, but, you know. Um, but, of course, uh, and I know at the time, I, you know, I never met uh, Bill Gates, but other people in my company did. And Bill Gates, you know, in the 94 time frame, didn't really take the Internet seriously. And so, for him... Internet Explorer was a way of keeping his toe in the waters, but without committing resources. And so, you know, they had one or two people on the Microsoft side taking the fruits of our labor and, you know, relabeling Microsoft Explorer. Well, then one day, Bill Gates got religion and put 800 people on Internet Explorer. And so our contribution became really tiny, but I was surprised that... Uh, you know, the notice of, you know, some uh, technology from Spyglass was on Internet Explorer until as, just as recently as just a few years ago. Uh, and simultaneous with him um, getting religion, he decided that he would package Internet Explorer uh, with the software as opposed to trying to sell it as a separate product. And what that did is it, it collapsed the market for web browsers it collapsed our business model and, you know, things changed radically from that point on. And then everybody viewed web browsers as something that you always get for free, like an operating system. Well, I guess you don't get an operating system for free, but it comes with a computer. So uh, the early 90s uh, was kind of the, the beginning of where the Internet started to be used commercially. And I think that that would be known as the dot com boom. Yes. Uh, what role did Mosaic play in the dot com boom? Well, okay. So I would I, I would I would think the dot com boom was be in the late nineties, okay. the early nineties, ninety two. Uh, the Internet protocols have been around for years, you know, with uh, uh, Tim Berners Lee uh, and CERN, but nobody had really developed a graphical web browser where the graphics and the text were interspersed until the team uh, of which Mark Andreessen was part developed Mosaic at NCSA. And that was completely independent of us. And, in, and so the NCSA Mosaic arguably created the internet that we know today. Um, people saw, oh, wow, you know, we've got this hyperlink system where you can link between different things and it's got embedded graphics. You can read it. And, you know, we all kind of knew that the protocol that Tim Berners-Lee had, had uh, published had that capability, but, and there had been textual browsers for a long time, but embedded graphics was really the, the big thing. And that was the, the freedom that NCSA gave a bunch of students that, on their own develop uh, in CSA Mosaic. So Mosaic uh, came uh, at the beginning of everything. So yes. what, um, what did early web browsers like Mosaic allow um, you know, commercial users to do that uh, was currently unable to do before the invention of Mosaic and early web browsers. Right. Um, so, you know, the internet uh, or what it was earlier called ARPANET had been around even earlier. I mean, been around since the late 60s. Um, it, the internet pre-Mosaic was not designed for civilians. 
It was designed for people, and by civilians, I mean the, the standard public. Right. Um, it was designed for professionals, professional computer people who were exchanging information. Um, what Mosaic did was it showed that you could create an interface to information that could be used by anybody. That you didn't have to know how to program. You didn't have to know HTML or HTTP. All you had to do is click. Um, and that was an aha moment. Uh, during the uh, mid 90s, I was on a, a program. I was working at NASA at the time, NASA Goddard. And we had a billion dollar project to develop an interface for the Earth observing system, such as Landsat and Aqua and Terra. Uh, and unfortunately, the internet in general and um, Mosaic in particular obsoleted everything we did because our billion dollar mission was to create an, an easy to use interface for all of NASA's data. The, the big breakthrough um, for business was the original design of HTML and HTML was for hypertext documents, documents that could link to other documents. Um, and it wasn't until later that people realized that those hypertext documents don't have to be static, they can be dynamic. In other words, that the data you see in the screen doesn't have to be an HTML file that's stored on some server, it can be created on the fly. And the mid to late 90s was that realization that you could use this dynamic creation to do things like sell stuff. I mean, that was just novel that you could actually show stuff on the internet and click and collect payment information and actually buy stuff. And that was all enabled by dynamic uh, information. Nowadays, of course, we don't even think about that because you guys have all been born when we have dynamic information. But you know, we went from a mindset of all information like uh, a great encyclopedia that's hypertext linked to an interface to people that want to do stuff and see stuff. Okay. And that was a big change. And there was no one person or one technology or one vision that just occurred you know, gradually. I think Amazon was one of the first players in that. So I'd like to transition a little bit. Um, I know a big part of your uh, past has been uh, your uh, involvement with astrophysics and your PhD. You yes. and I have spoke briefly about your PhD and I found it very fascinating. So I think that other people would like to hear about it. If you could, uh, could you explain um, what you got your PhD in astrophysics? How, how did you get it? What uh, yeah. are you researching? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, study, you know, it's like, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Study right. study. Uh, one amusing thing is I finished my PhD thesis uh, during the second year of my startup company. So it was, I also wrote a book that year, so it was a busy year. Uh, so uh, my PhD thesis was uh, about neutron stars. Neutron stars are the collapsed corpses of stars, you take the mass of the sun, which is a million times the size and density of the earth and collapse it down to something the size of, um, I was gonna say San Diego, but even smaller than that, the suburb of San Diego, you know, 10 kilometers across. It's the densest matter we know in the universe. The only thing denser would be a black hole, but that's not matter, that's a rip in the fabric of space time. Uh, and because you've got so much mass compressed in such a pl uh, place, it's, it's a way that you can test nature. So we spend billions of dollars with high energy uh, physics, colliding particles at very high energy. And when we collide particles at very high energy, they tell us about nature. They, they tell us when you do things at high energy, it tells us about how the universe works. What, what are the fundamental particles? Well, the energetics around a neutron star are a billion times greater than we could ever reproduce on Earth. 
And so a neutron star is in effect a great physics library for looking at extreme situations. And those extreme situations tell us about the way the universe is really wired. Uh, my particular research had to do with some weird observations that we'd seen. Um, one of the ways that we observe these uh, neutron stars is through x-rays. Uh, because when material falls under the surface of these neutron stars, it's so, the gravitational force is so intense that when they hit the surface, they produce x-rays. To give us some idea about that, when I dropped this can, you heard it because the potential energy here, the potential gravitational energy is then converted into sound energy. If I drop this can from orbit onto the earth, you're going to see it burn up. And this will reach a temperature of a few thousand degrees because you know it's falling down to the surface of the earth. The gravitational uh, force of a neutron star is so great that if I take this and drop it onto the surface, when it hits the surface, it'll be at billions of degrees and it'll produce an amount of energy equivalent to a 50 megaton thermonuclear weapon, okay? So it's in a very, very extreme environment. We saw these x-rays being produced by these stars, but they didn't make any sense because they were pulsing. And they were pulsing in a weird way. They weren't pulsing like the thing is spinning. They weren't pulsing like the thing was orbiting. It was a very, a pulsing that wasn't periodic. And nothing, no theory made, uh, made any sense about that. And so my theory was the reason it pulsed was that these explosions on the surface were so intense that they pushed the matter off that was trying to get to the surface. The radiation pressure, just radiation itself pushed the material away even though the gravitational force was so strong. And then it took a while for that material to recollect itself and then reaccrete. Uh, and people had tried to do that model before, but it never worked. And, you know, my sole scientific breakthrough was to say, aha, uh -huh, you're treating this as if everything is classical, but it's not. Um, the, uh, the light that is pushing the stuff away is pushing that stuff. Uh, the stuff is moving so rapidly that that stuff is blue shifted and it's going to have a different light. And I won't go into complexities, but in the process of trying to figure out the radiation and the stuff being pushed back, the only way that I could figure it out was when I generated images of that data. And so I had my team write software to generate those images. And then I thought, aha, other people could use this technology. And that was the genesis of the team at NCSA developing that first visualization software, which was widely used with the people using that supercomputer center and that we then used to start the first company. So this all ties together. You mentioned um, you wrote a book. Uh, yes. What, your book was written on your visualization software uh, that was used for astrophysics research? Uh, I wrote two books. Uh, my first book is called The Data Handbook. Um, and I wrote that uh, in 1992 because, believe it or not, we had a lot of professional researchers who didn't understand bits and bytes. Um, and they wanted to do computer modeling, but they didn't understand the fundamentals of just data. And so we figured we'd just write a little, you know, uh, a little pamphlet to explain bits and bytes, but that little pamphlet grew until it became a book, which Spring of Earth had been published and became a reasonably good seller. Um, much later in the late 90s, uh, I was contracted to write a book on scientific visualization. And the first chapter of that book was background on color. That first chapter became 300 pages. And it's like, hey, let's do the visualization book later. Let's take this chapter and turn it into a book, which is my second book, Number by Colors. Uh, by the way, the visualization book, I've never finished it. <laughs> so. <laughs> so specifically, you, uh, you bring up visualization does that mean you're visualizing data, like in like statistics? Or are you visualizing, um, like, is the computer program simulating something? Or 
what specifically do you mean by well, visualization? Both. Um, so you, you're all familiar with line graphs, okay? What you're doing is you take a one-dimensional column of data and you're generating a line, okay? Um, I take a photograph of you. In the camera, that is a two-dimensional array of numbers, okay? And I take those numbers and I generate what looks like an image of, of you, Jeremy, okay? So that's 2D visualization. 1D visualization, I take a column of numbers and I use the height of the line to represent numbers. A two-dimensional array, I've taken the numbers in the two-dimensional array and turned them into colors. Um, you can talk about a three-dimensional visualization. You have uh, a cube of data, such as, say, the temperature of air over North Carolina. That would be a three-dimensional cube of numbers. Well, how do you represent that three-dimensional cube of numbers? And there are many techniques, most of them involve color. Uh, you can't just do it with lines, you have to do it with something else. And so scientific visualization or data visualization, those terms are still used, is a process of taking uh, typically very large amounts of data and trying to make it so you can instantly get sense of it from a graphical point of view. And so you can see data as contour plots. You can see data as a, you know, kind of a mountain visualization where you have the heights of stuff. Uh, you can do volumetric visualization where you cut into the data to see it. You can do uh, isospheres where you represent the three-dimensionality of data at a particular level. Uh, you're, you will do that typically if you're doing visualizing, say, thunderstorms. Um, but all of these are techniques of converting data into images. Every time you look at a weather map, you're looking at visualization. They're converting temperature into colors. Uh, or, you know, the hurricane is going to hit uh, Florida. They're converting probability into numbers. You know, red means high probability of, of uh, high winds. Green means low probability. And so our software was one of the, was actually probably the first software that could be used on personal computers to generate those sorts of images. It seems that you've done so much stuff in your career, so many different things, so many very, very cool things. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, like, uh, what inspires you to keep going? Because most people, they, you know, struggle with inspiration and uh, they're, they're um, looking in, at the wrong yeah, thing. So, so I, you know, if you read inspirational things, they all say, follow your dream and all that. Most of us don't have dreams. So, you know, and, and I, I didn't have a single dream. I just fell into fun stuff. Okay. And the thing I enjoy most now is teaching. Uh, and so I teach mostly astronomy uh, to uh, North Carolina State University, University of North Carolina, and I also teach uh, lifelong learners, retired people uh, in a course at Duke. And my next, and I usually teach astrophysics. My last course at Duke was on the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, the course before that was on a set, you know, uh, colonizing our solar system. My next course for them will be on color vision. Uh, so, I, you know, what Andrew was saying about his career path, I, you know, that resonated with me. I've done a lot of startups. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I've done two startups. I've begun two startups. I've invested in lots of startups. Um, and I've done a lot of varied things, but I think the thing that has given me the most joy recently is just teaching. What about any any personal figures, any aspirational role models, Albert Einstein, anybody? Um, so, I, you know, one of the things that, that struck me, I, I manage the alumni relations in my department. And in physics, the people that you want to approach to get donate to the department are not the superstars because they're not the ones that start the company. It's the C students. You know, they're the ones that go off and do different things, and they're the ones that become successful. Uh, so I was never the best and the brightest. So, so Einstein was never a role model for me because he's like a different species. Um, my role model was Isaac Asimov when I was growing up. Uh, most people don't know him, but 
when I was growing up in the 60s, he was he was the Carl Sagan of the era. He was the science popularizer. And I read everything I could grab my hands on. And I always wanted to be him. I always wanted to explain science to the masses. And so I would say he is by was my young role model. Interesting. You uh, you brought up James Webb, yes, uh, and the telescope. Um, what do advancing technologies, especially in the realm of um, astrophysics and, and optics, what what is the meaning that they show to our humanity? Since we could tell right. from the last generation of of uh, space telescopes, and then now, how much more data we are receiving? How faster they can go through space and how right. much data they can uh, so, collect. So there was a famous quote by uh, back in the 50s, someone was, uh, uh, they're talking about uh, Fermilab, uh, which was uh, the first um, national accelerator lab. And a senator said, you know, how does Fermilab contribute to the defense of the country? And the response, uh, I, I think it was, this was Leon Letterman who made this response, said it makes the country worth defending. And, and so the question is, in my mind, the scientific endeavor is where we're trying to understand the universe. We're trying to comprehend the universe. And I personally don't think there's any more noble endeavor than doing that. Um, the, the James Webb is, is vital for that for the following reason. Uh, in, in the 21st century, we have made discoveries that show us what we don't know. In other words, we, we used, they used to be unknown unknowns, now they're known unknowns. What we've discovered is 95% of the universe we know nothing about, in particular dark matter, dark energy. Uh, we do not comprehend the creation of the universe. We do not know where the uh, forces of the universe come from. Why are we here? Okay, and these are fundamental these are the deepest questions we can ask as a species. And I think devoting some of our efforts towards understanding our place in the universe and what the universe is, is the most noble thing we can do as humans. Um, and what the Hubble telescope discovered uh, in the 90s uh, with what we now call the Hubble deep field image was that um, galaxies were being produced in the early universe, much earlier and a much higher rate than any of our any of our uh, um, theories had predicted, which meant we did not understand the creation of the universe at a fundamental level. There was something wrong with our knowledge. The James Webb could not do any more because the James Webb was a visible light telescope, and the early universe is all infrared, because as the universe expands, the light gets stretched and get stretched into the infrared. So we needed a telescope. If we wanted to understand the universe, we can't, big, we can't build accelerators big enough to explore the fundamental particles of the universe. The only thing we can do is explore extremes. Neutron stars and black holes, those are extremes. The creation of the universe itself, the Big Bang itself is the most extreme part of the universe that exists. And so we went to explore that. And the only way that we can explore that is with exploring very faint infrared light. And the James Webb was designed to do that. Um, and the James Webb, even just these few months of operation has shown us more about that history that the Hubble could not show us that is just astounding. And what it will do is will revolutionize our understanding of that 95% of, of, of the universe that we don't understand now, dark matter, dark energy, it will increase our understanding in how the universe was created, how the Big Bang actually happened. And it will try and settle one of the greatest mysteries of the last 10 years, which is what we call the Hubble tension. The fact that our observations of the expansion of the universe when we look at galaxies and we look at the Big Bang, they don't match up. There's something we don't understand. I call that the uh, kind of camel's nose under the tent. We see these little evidence that 
there are things that don't make sense. And we believe that these little pieces of evidence, that some things don't make sense, it's not something that can be fixed easily. These are signs of, to a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of the universe and only the James Webb can tell us where to go. Do you think um, AI and advancing technology will help us understand more about ourselves in terms of the universe and how much we understand now? Uh, well, yes, as a tool. Um, so for example, I, I was at a talk uh, at Duke where uh, a woman was talking about gravitational lensing. Light is meant not only by lenses, but by matter itself. Uh, and so if you have a black hole, for example, or a big galaxy, it will warp the light and we can see the effects of that warping. And she was talking about using this gravitational lensing to map the unseen matter in the universe, which we call dark matter. And after the talk, I said, so, you know, when a galaxy's image has been warped by these black holes, how does that warped image of the, of the galaxy, what does that look like? What, do you, what are you looking for? And she pauses and says, oh, maybe you don't understand. We can't see them. Only the computer can see them. Only the computer is scanning millions and millions of images of galaxies. Are they able to, to extract how that image has been warped by gravity and by comparing and contrasting other images close to by that, that they map what kind of mass would have created those warping in all of those images. It can't be seen by the eye. In other words, we're at a point where astronomy is no longer observational. Astronomy is fundamentally a computational science now. And AI is a fundamental part of it. And it's so fundamental, we don't even note it, okay? It is just one of those tools in the toolbox. All right, well, I have one last question for you. So okay. most of the people who are attending are um, just starting out college. Uh, and even if they're not, uh, my question to you is, what advice do you have for people that are trying to pursue meaningful things in their life? Oh. <laughs> um. That's a tough one. I mean, I, I never, I, I never, I never did a straight line. Um, I just wanted to do fun stuff, you know. I, and you know, I, I didn't have a, a single vision or or mission in my life. I just wanted to do fun stuff. I'm, I, I guess. The only wisdom I can entail is whatever you do, however you change your career, I, I think it's worthwhile to pay for flexibility, to, to you know, pay for the ability to try different things or go different things. But, you know, I sometimes wish I would have lived my life where every moment professionally uh, could have been uh, wound up in court. In other words, and I could defend it. In other words, always do right, always tell the truth, because someday it'll come back to bite you, even if it costs you. Um, and other than that, just try and find fun stuff. I don't know what else to say. I like that answer. Yeah. All right. Well, that wraps up uh, all the questions that I have for you. Thank you very much for <laughs> answering them all. Uh, maybe there are people in the comments that would like to ask you questions, but other than that, thank you for, for answering all my questions. Sure. Are we, we have somebody to raise their hand. Hi. Yeah, I actually did have a question. Well, first I want to say, I appreciate how your belief that like a life in pursuit of like reasons and explanations about existence is a life well spent I, I really appreciate you saying that um and it resonated with me it's so my major right now intended is computational biology so it, right. that definitely resonated with me and 
my question is kind of like two and one. Um, do you feel as though throughout your career you had a good balance between like your love of astrophysics as well as your like love and appreciation for software development? And did you also feel like you had the flexibility to do both um, at any time? Yeah. Um, so that, that's a, a, a fairly specific question. Let me answer that. Um, the people that do research full-time, tenured, tenure track professors, that's a train that if you get off, you can't really get back on. I mean, people say you can, but you can't. Sorry. Um, and so I got off that train pretty early because I started a company right out of, after my PhD. So I knew I was never going to get back on that train. So the way I stay involved in the scientific endeavor is through public outreach. I love doing talks. I love teaching. I love telling people about stuff. Uh, and I, every day I go to my office, I work with tenured professors doing real research and I get to listen to them and I get to understand what they're doing at a deep level. Uh, and, and so that's rewarding. Uh, and so for me, that combination of outreach and computing is, is one that works for me. It might not work for everybody. Okay, thank you so much for sure. answering that and just for today in general, thank you. Yeah, sure. Joey's got his hand raised. Hi, yes. Um, I was, I've been wondering, um, with your background in technology as well as your background in, um, in physics, have you, are you, are you interested in um, quantum computing at all? Yeah, so when I was, at, uh, when I was working for the government, I, I uh, ran a course in uh, introductory computer science for uh, the intelligence uh, uh, community. And we had a couple of, everybody was talking about quantum computing at that time. Uh, and in fact, in my uh, department in North Carolina, uh, we have three or four researchers working on quantum computing. But here's the thing that people don't appreciate. Uh, quantum, you know, they talk about, hey, this computer has, you know, five qubits and 10 qubits or 20 qubits. It's my understanding that to make a practical quantum computer, you need at least a thousand qubits per piece of information because the, the, the error rates on these qubits are so high. And nobody talks about that. I mean, if you need a, if you want, instead of just a demonstration, you want to be able to do practical computing at faster than classical speeds, you're going to need hundreds of thousands or millions of qubits. And I've never heard anybody talking about that. So to me, quantum computing is like, you know, a, a fusion reactor. These are things that are aspirational, but I'm not convinced either one will happen in my lifetime. I, I mean, obviously quantum computers work. The question is, will they ever work faster than classical computers on anything? And I, if that happens in my lifetime, I'll be gratified. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um... Yeah, so it's it's trying to the, the theory is that they'll work really good if we can get past well the, the error rate of the qubits. Yeah, and and here's the thing: I'm, I I know more about uh, fusion reactors than I do about qubits, but in both cases, everybody the 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 popular press talks about the breakthroughs, but these are scientific breakthroughs, not engineering breakthroughs. The the engineering challenges of a practical fusion reactor are more daunting even than the physics breakthroughs that are needed. And the same is true of quantum computing, you know, because you have to, you have to start with classical data, you have to convert it into qubits and keep them from uh, uh, decohering. And you have to do it with hundreds of thousands and millions of these puppies, all of whom want to decohere instantly, and then have some interface to get that data out. And the engineering challenges for that as opposed to a demonstration. And not only that, but it's not clear how many algorithms quantum computing can actually do faster than classical. I, I mean, the, 
it, it is not a general purpose computer. You can't just throw stuff in and, and like you can on a computer and get stuff out. It only works for very specific algorithms. And, and as I'm reading in science and nature, the number of algorithms where only quantum computers can go very fast is, is shrinking. People find classical workarounds for some of those algorithms that were said to be only in quantum computing realm. Okay, so you, so basically, what you're saying is, even if um, if we do get over this hurdle, they will quantum computers won't necessarily um, replace the home PC. They cannot. Uh, by I, I mean, any quantum computer uh, expert will tell you that they are not general purpose computers. What they do do is there are some algorithms. Most famous, of course, is the you know factoring prime numbers, which is why you want it for. Uh, you know, why the uh, intelligence community is interested in them. Um, but it is the, the, the vast majority of things you want to do can be done faster on a classical computer. Jeffrey? Jeffrey, can you speak? Oh, oh Jeffrey, Jeffrey put a note. Yeah. Can you talk more about fusion? Uh, Jeffrey, what would you like to know? Uh, what's the restriction there? Well, uh, so in fusion, uh, first of all, we haven't reached um, scientific break even. We don't know how to uh, keep a sustained fusion reactor going. Uh, and we've, got, we've been working on it for 60 years now. The, the problem is that the, we use a, a, you, can't, you can't put a 100 million, million degree reaction in any sort of material container. So you have to use magnetic fields. And what we've discovered to our woe is that these magnetic fields have a mind of their own. And we, it's taken 60 years of research trying to figure out how to tame that. We're still, uh, we still have a far way to go. We've tried inertial containment uh, through lasers. And I know that Livermore announced a breakthrough, but that's a scientific breakthrough, not an engineering breakthrough. It, it, I don't think inertial confinement can ever be practical. And so we've got uh, the problem there, but then there's a more fundamental problem. Let's say that you have a sustained fusion reaction, um, most of the fusion reactor reactions that you're, they're looking at generate a huge supply of neutrons. Problem with neutrons is they're neutral. And the problem with neutro neutral particles is you can't direct them with magnetic or electric fields. And so those neutrons will hit anything that uh, is around the reactor, namely the reactor containment vessel and things outside the reactor containment vessel. And that intense radiation flux of neutrons will destroy just about any uh, material known to man. Uh, and so the industry has ideas about that using liquid sodium or li you know metals, liquid metals that uh, you know will absorb the neutrons. Yeah, I mean, those are all possible ideas, but it, it, there's just an enormous, enormous engineering challenge to dealing with that e extreme neutron flux, which is actually the source of the energy of the uh, fusion reactor. And, and so, you know, and every time you turn, there's yet another either scientific or engineering challenge. So we should spend billions of dollars on fusion research because if we ever do have a practical fusion reactor, you know, um, most of the problems of our society go away. We don't have to use carbon anymore, for example. But it, the problem is a lot harder than most people realize. Certainly harder than the pipe of the press is letting on.
Okay, less chance to ask any questions if you'd like. Alan? Uh, hi. Uh, I was just wondering, like, earlier you were talking about how fields like astrophysics have become, like, purely computation computational at this point. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, um, do you think that the other natural sciences will follow suit in that uh, same manner? Oh, well, they already have. I mean, we just heard from someone in computational biology. Uh, I, I can't think of a, of a scientific endeavor where computation isn't at the core of what they do. Um, you know, computation, computers enable us to, to collect and analyze reams of data. And then now we have reams of data, so much data that we can't analyze it by hand. Uh, and then we have to do analyses using, uh, you know, various methods. So, you know, computation is at the core of all science at this point. Um, so like as someone who's interested in going into physics and computing in that sense, would you recommend uh, data science as something that uh, one should look at? Um, so uh, data science is an incredible growth industry because I mean, the whole world runs on big data now. Uh, that, but, um, you know, I, I think if they were interested in physics and data science, what you want to do is get the physics degree um, because it, it's easy to add data science onto physics. It's difficult to go the other way around. Um, I mean, most physicists wind up doing data science. And so someone that got a physics major with a data science minor would be in a really good position. Um, I mean, that, that said, someone who just got a data science major is in a really good position, but not necessarily for physics because other fields will want to snarf them. All right, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Great. All right, I think uh, I think we'll wrap it up now. Thanks, so, Jeremy. This has been fun. Yeah, thank you very much for for joining and and talking. I really appreciate it. And I think everybody else does. Um, and anybody wants to contact me afterwards, uh, let me put my email address in the uh, in the chat. Feel free to email me. Awesome. Thank you. All right, well, that concludes our uh, guest speaker presentation. Uh, I'll stick around for a little bit after if anybody has questions about the club. But other than that, uh, the meeting uh, has been dismissed. Great. Thank you Thanks, again, Dr. Dr. Thanks, Brand. Andrew. Thanks. Yeah. Bye-bye.